Hi, I'm Ed Amoroso from Tag Cyber, and I'm here today with an industry veteran and expert, my friend Grady Summers, who is the EVP of Products at SailPoint. Grady, how you doing? Doing good, Ed. How about you? It's good to see. You. I'm looking forward to uh, talking. I, I'm looking forward to learning. Um, hey, we're going to talk about identity, predictive identity, and in artificial intelligence, and kind of predictions and so on. But let's start. Just give us a, a thumbnail on what what you guys do at uh, SailPoint, the problems that you guys address, and then we can dig in a little bit. Yeah. So at SailPoint, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I, when I started learning about SailPoint, as you know, I've been here for uh, just eight or nine months now. Uh, seemed like kind of one of the most important security companies. It's at some of the, the biggest organizations in the world that a lot of people in the industry just aren't that familiar with, you know. And what we do fundamentally is, I mean, it's critical for complex organizations, not just big orgs, but orgs that have sort of complex um, access needs. And, and we make sure that the right people have access to the right information at the right time. So we do that by, by understanding who's in the organization first, helping organizations get visibility into all their identities. Like we all know, hey, we have a lot of systems with a lot of accounts. What we do uniquely well is pull those together and give the, the organization a view into identities. And then we let the organization say, well, here are the kinds of people and the sort of roles that should be, have access to what? So we talk about uh, roles and entitlements. What do you actually have access to? What can you do inside an app? And we manage all that at a really massive scale. You know, when I first met your CEO, Mark, um, he, I, we ver I was very impressed with the way you guys kind of weave intelligence and analytics and some machine learning right into it. Tell me, there's a phrase you guys use, predictive identity. Tell, tell me what, what that means. That, that really sounds quite fascinating. Yeah. In fact, it's, you know, it's funny you mentioned Mark. The company, believe it or not, is 15 years old uh, this week. So it's kind of an interesting milestone for us. And I mentioned that because it's neat to see how this space has evolved and how cell phones sort of been a leader each step of the way. And I say that as someone who's is really quite new here still. So it's neat looking at the history. And you touched on this predictive identity concept. And look, that's that's our way of talking about the, the data science team and, and the machine learning that we bring to bear on these problems that we know really well. So Sailpoint knows these products or these problems well as experts who've been doing this 15 years. But over the last few years, the investment in data science has been really impressive with the company. And the goal of this is, you know, the, the things that we do are vitally important. They're done at scale, but they can frankly be tedious. And you look at something that is scaled, that is really critical, um, but can be tedious and repetitive, that's just begging for machine learning to help make it more efficient. And so in the world of identity, uh, you of course have provisioning where you have people who get uh, access to apps. You have people who can request access to, to applications. We've all been in that situation, right? You come to a new company, and you realize, well, on top of the email that you got day one, you need access to you know, these forms or these document, uh, these sources of documentation or these new systems. So you have these access requests, and somebody's got to approve those access requests. And in most big organizations, for compliance reasons, you have to recertify your access on a regular basis. Well, you know, requesting access for things and finding the resources you need, um, that's a problem that machine learning can really help with. They can look at who I am and uh, what my peers are doing, and they can suggest things uh, that they have access to. It can also help with those approvals. So knowing the types of people who have access to resource X, and having seen that thousands of times and seeing a human making a decision on those requests, well, that becomes something that we can turn the machine learning algorithms onto as well. And then to say nothing of this problem of recertifications, I'll tell you, if anyone who, who's watching works at a, an organization that has to do certifications for compliance reasons, they know how incredibly tedious it is. We find there's just a lot of rubber stamping in that process. A lot of organizations just, uh, or managers are, are you know, having to approve for a dozen different direct reports. And this problem is just begging for uh, machine learning to help with. To look at what do I have access to? When did I last use it? What do my peers have? Um, and, and help to automate some of that really tedious work to make life easier for, for our end users. Yeah. Let's talk about access, something you and I both know. We, we, we were both CISOs of very large organizations, and we know that question of, who, like, who can access what was always something. I, I always felt like I never quite knew, and I know you guys had addressed that. Help the folks who are watching. How do you figure that out? Are you pulling data? Are you going out looking for things? What, what's the, what, how do you solve that problem of helping someone understand who has access to what? 
Yeah, so as you as you know, this isn't a problem you can just throw technology at. Fundamentally, um, who should have access to what starts with some really basic business questions. Um, you know, what, what are my assets? How important are they? What kind of data is in them? And only when an organization understands what they have, they can start to talk about who should be able to access it. Um, but that's where we help. And look, we help companies a lot with that business angle because we're fortunate to have a great group of, uh, of experts who have been through this at dozens and dozens of companies. So we can help businesses through that. Um, but I would say we help give them the data they need to answer those questions. So I mentioned earlier, providing a holistic view into all of your identities. I was talking to a customer just the other day who was blown away. They had way more identities than they realized because um, you know, they tended to think in terms of enterprise IT users, but they had a, a sales organization signing up tons of partners and pulling them into uh, an environment where they could access documents. And then they had um, remote, remote, excuse me, remote folks out in the field that needed access to the technical material to provide support. And you start to look at all these, these partners and, um, and, and your supply chain and your customers, and a lot of organizations are just blown away by how many people are accessing things in their org. So we can give you a view into those identities, and we can start to show orgs for the first time who has access to what. And you know, this is kind of this is basic for someone who's been in identity for a long time. But when you start to get that view, you see, I mean, this is some really basic data science and basic statistics, to be honest, when you start to do clustering. And you can see, wow, everyone who has access to this particular file share, for example, or to this particular, you know, uh, general ledger system over here, this ERP system, they really tend to cluster. And so you can see, well, they almost have very similar roles, or they all have common attributes, or they're in a certain location. And that's eye-opening for customers for the first time to get that view into, well, these other people have access to this, so why are these outliers? And this is where you start to discover things like, um, you know, these one-off uh, account uh, uh, requests and approvals that maybe never should have been, or they should have been taken away. Like maybe someone needed access for a short time and it just persisted. Or we start to see is a lot of legacy accounts, orphan accounts from people who have left the org, um, but because poor processes, uh, processes weren't in place or processes broke, um, it's really shocking to see how many people shouldn't have the access they have. I mean, that's an important distinction, the, the who has access versus who should, right? I mean, in the perfect world, they match, but they never do. So is it like, are you, is it, I love that heuristic of clustering, because that's something people can understand, like the, to have intelligent algorithms that use these clustering, uh, these clustering methods to extrapolate out and say, you know, Alice and Bob are in this group. Alice has these kinds of things. Bob shows a lot of similar attributes. You ought to go check and see what's going on. Is, is that how we figure out the should part, like or, around, um, you know, starting with what they have and then and then determining, I guess, uh, making a policy and role-based uh, yeah. decision? Am I, am I reading that right? Is that how it works? Yeah, that's right. So you start with that visibility. Now you can see it, uh, and, and that really helps. But describing uh, what the type, who should have access to this data comes with that visibility. And yeah. A lot of times organizations will, um, and by the way, this, this concept of like role-based access is something that you know, we've been talking about for 20 years, uh, 30, 40 years even in security. Um, and it's funny, we keep hearing like roles are dead, but long live roles. It's that kind of thing where everyone hates to do this, uh, but uh, because it can feel very forced and artificial. But a lot of orgs are on this journey. There's two ways to do it. You're on a journey to define roles and say, okay, we have a level one bank teller in the Southeast region, and that role should have access to all these types of things. Um, what we're seeing now is organizations realize that's that may be sort of nirvana, but it's rigid, it's difficult, and it tends to break, and it's out of date the moment you put it into place. So now we see more of a turn toward like um, attribute-based or policy-based uh, access. And so this is something that uh, we're working with a lot of customers on is, hey, we don't necessarily want to define rigid roles. So for example, we have a product that will say, look, you don't have to create roles. We're going to look at the attributes of who's accessing what and start to like create those on the fly for you and recommend that, hey, here's a role you should create. And we're going to tell you when we think it should change. And that gets organizations off that like that burdensome concept of create a role and constantly updating the role and having a fall out of date. You're able to provide any, we mentioned sort of visibility into kind of the static setup of who can do what, but how about determining what they're actually doing? Like the fact that I have access may may not mean that I'm making use of it. How, how do you pull that kind of data? That would seem like a very different kind of uh, activity. Yeah, it is. 
Yeah. And I'm glad you brought it up. This is something that you and I didn't even talk about beforehand, but um, this is something we've realized is the, the world's changing and identity uh, governance used to be what we would call admin time. Like you'd set it up once and then you'd have to go, you know, whenever someone moved to a different role, it left the org, you'd go and update. But we've realized that, hey, look, this is so dynamic that we need to be looking every minute at what people are actually doing with that access. And so we'll be launching some exciting new uh, features we'll announce next quarter uh, where we'll start to take in information that live data from your identity provider, like you know, your, your um, authentication system, your access management system, and even your applications themselves. See, like, you know, how is Ed actually using that access that we just gave? And, and the use cases here are, are really exciting. Well, we can use this information to make that tedious certification process way easier because we could see, hey, you haven't used something in six months. So maybe automatically deprovision that, right? So your, your manager never has to go through and, and approve or deny it. But what's really neat is what we can do on risk is we can start to see unusual access patterns. Um, and we can automatically do things like, hey, we're going to suspend account access. We're going to force you to two-factor uh, with your identity provider. Uh, we're going to force a password change when we see changes to the risk environment. And that involves uh, you know, working with the SIMS in an organization, for example. We're not going to try to replicate that functionality, but we'll work with a SIM and say, hey, it looks like Grady's account is now high risk. Grady has access to a lot of sensitive resources. So let's make a really on the fly determination of how we can lower risk while uh, while the SOC figures out what's going on. Yeah, probably true all through the whole security operations life cycle, well beyond just the SIM. Yeah, it's and a, you know, it's interesting. Well, this kind of, yeah, this gets to an interesting point that you and I have chatted about, which is, um, you know, I, I came after a, a career at uh, FireEye where really very threat centric, threat vulnerability, incident response centric. Um, and prior to that, as a, a CISO, you start to see these patterns and you see again and again, like it's about the identity. You know, and there was a breach and yeah, it was malware, but the malware is trying to steal the identity. There was a compromised laptop, but fundamentally the attacker wanted to assume the identity. And um, it's just interesting when you think through what happens in a security operations center when there's a breach, one of the first things you do is, okay, who was breached? Okay, someone opened a phishing email, who was it? What do they have access to? Let's go look at their account. Let's look what they've been accessing. And you start to say like, yeah, the malware is exciting, the, the network analytics, the forensic, all cool stuff. It just comes back to the identity. And this is why we think that, um, you know, there's an exciting future for building around this concept of identity security that we talk a lot about at SailPoint and, and say, hey, how can we connect better with the SOC? Like identity and the SOC uh, used to be like two different domains that almost never talk. Let's connect those so we can make life a lot easier for the incident responders out there, help buy them some time when they start to, to research something. And let's, let's make the job of the identity uh, governance professional easier because they can now react into a real time to changing risk levels. So I see a ton of synergy there. And um, I'm, I'm really pumped about our roadmap over the next uh, six to 12 months as we start to address that. That's great. Now, uh, back in the day, it was pretty easy to know where your assets were. <laughs> Everything's yeah, sitting right. on a local area network. You guys, I'm going to guess 100% of your customers use multiple clouds and yeah. SaaS services. Talk to me about how that affects all of this. Does, I would imagine that it, it, it certainly expands the problem, but does it expand linearly or do you get this exponential problem as you as you blow out into multiple clouds? What's been your observation? Yeah, so what we notice is, um, you know, an important part of what we do at SailPoint is that provisioning is giving access to applications. And you're right, it used to be fairly static. Like once you got your apps on board, you would add, oh gosh, I remember back, when I was a CISO, so you got that first list and maybe you'd add a few every year, you know, but you sort of had your enterprise apps that were fairly stable. And like you said, you knew where they were, where they were, they were right in the data center. Um, what we just see now is just new apps coming in all the time. And the demand for these connectors, it's you know, literally thousands of different types of systems that companies need to connect with downstream. Like I said, just new ones coming in seemingly every week. So yeah, we have to help work stay on top of that. You know, it, it's got to be quick to onboard a new app. It's got to be quick to, to pull it to governance. Um, we're working on something that we'll be really excited to announce next quarter to help organizations get their arms around what they have to discover like that shadow IT that's not being governed at all. Because we'll talk to organizations who um, you know, are a little bit blindsided by new apps coming on board that they want to wrap into their governance process. So we've got to make that a ton easier uh, for identity works to, to figure out what's out there to go. You know, I'm going to guess that your tool must be of interest or maybe popular with the audit community. What, what's been your, because uh, I know that uh, <laughs> it seems like uh, 
two out of every three audits have roles and identities and access wrapped into the middle of it. What, how has yeah. the audit community uh, responded both to the platform and to some of the topics we've been talking about here? Yeah, so auditors are looking at uh, reports from SailPoint you know, every day as they do their audits at, at mm. all of our customers. Um, I'd say every big audit firm is, is really well versed with using SailPoint. I'd say pretty comfortable with it. What's interesting too is on the consulting side of the house, when you look at the, um, you know, the big audit and, and advisory firms, is um, we do a lot of work with, with the consulting side of the house to implement SailPoint. I mentioned there's a lot of business process reengineering, and when you, you look at our, our great partners like EY or Deloitte or Accenture, or PwC, um, that's what they're so good at is helping these organizations kind of figure out the business side of things and then bringing us in uh, to enable it technically. Now, I'm going to ask you to take out the old crystal ball here. Uh, we're right. You and I are filming this at the end of 2020. So it seems pretty natural to ask you what you think um, next year will look like in this area. Do you, do you imagine that this problem uh, is going to continue to grow or, or do you see things getting better? What, uh, what What's your observation uh, just in and around? Yeah, I guess, you know, there, there are uh, two things that I've, I've got in mind and funny enough, we Talked about them both in the last few minutes, uh, so they're they're timely. But look, I think we're going to see a couple of things if we look ahead in 2021, as we touched on this idea of um, this predictive identity uh, and machine learning. You just asked about auditors. I think 2021 is a year that auditors will start to get more comfortable with an AI-driven decision process. In other words, in the past, um, we said, "Hey, look, the tech is there for us to automatically do a certification, but will an auditor accept it?" And talking to some of our friends uh, in the IT audit space, we realize that they will, but they need transparency. They need to know that it's not just a black box. They need to be able to see, for example, um, you know, the, the data that was used for input and the logging of the decisions that were made and when. So I think we're, you know, we're a while from it, uh, from finally eliminating all the, the tedium around identity governance, but uh, I'd say we're going to start to take some big steps toward it in 21. We'll, we'll start to see auditors get comfortable with that. The other one is, you know, this proliferation of SaaS applications we talked about. Um, I talked about the, the provisioning angle where, or the governance angle where orgs are saying, we want this stuff in our catalog. We want to provision access. I think in 21, we're going to see tremendous scrutiny on what those SaaS applications are doing and what data they're interacting with. You know, we're talking now just a few days removed from the news about the big solar winds issue and, and dozens or hundreds of companies being compromised um, by, by their own software. While a little bit different, we see a lot of similarities in the SaaS world, which is organizations are finding cool SaaS apps out there. They're hooking them into their IT infrastructure. One of the beautiful things about SaaS apps is how easily you can interconnect them. You know, your Gmail connects to your Calendly, which uh, connects to some knowledge management system, which, which uh, and on and on and on. And we see orgs are starting to stream these together and they're getting great productivity and they're more fast and agile than ever before. But they're starting to ask themselves, well, hold on, what is that app actually doing that I just connected to my, you know, my SaaS ERP system? What is it pulling? And uh, have we done the right diligence on that? So I look, I predict a, a lot more focus on SaaS application governance and, and what the SaaS applications could do. That's awesome. Now, now, Grady, for people who have some interest in the platform, is the website the best place for them to be in touch with you guys to get a little bit more info? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, SailPoint.com. Um, we've uh, got a lot of neat resources, actually, where we'll be announcing for customers or people who want to learn more. So I'd say also follow us on Twitter. Uh, you know, I, I uh, tweet about things from time to time of interest. I follow you. At Grady S. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. Well, listen, on behalf of the folks um, listening and also my team at Tag Cyber, I want to really thank you for taking some time. These are really, really important um, areas of modern cybersecurity, enterprise protection. Um, and I think they're, they're areas that are often um, not properly attended to. So I, I really do appreciate you taking some time. You to bet. Share. Thanks for the opportunity, Ed. Oh, that's great. Yeah. We'll talk to you later. And for everyone else, we'll see you next time.